Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tent Talk, the farmer's market podcast. This podcast is all about farmer's markets, how to increase your market business success while providing people with fresh food. Farmer's markets are essential. Whether you're a farmer's market manager or a small farmer or food maker selling at farmer's markets, you have found just the right podcast. This week, our guest is Sadie Sheffer, CEO and founder of Bread Seriously, making delicious and nourishing gluten-free sourdough bread in the San Francisco Bay Area. I am one of your hosts, Bridget Myers. I'm a longtime farmer's market manager and education coordinator at Farmer's Market Pros. And I'm Kat Fields-White, director of San Diego Markets, still an active farmer's market manager, market consultant, founder of Farmer's Market Pros, and host of the Farmer's Market Pros community. And I'm Justine Marzoni Mead, Tent Talk producer and marketing director for Farmers Market Pros. Today's episode of Tent Talk, the Farmers Market Podcast, is supported by consultant Sarah Delaban, the Good Foods CFO. Sarah brings clarity to financial planning and equips small food businesses to achieve profitability. With accessible tools, resources, and systems, Sarah lets you discover which products are boosting your business and which may need to be refined or left behind in order to be financially sustainable. Let Sarah help you take the guesswork out of where you are and where you're going in your food business. Find more information by clicking the Sarah Delaban Consulting logo on the resource page at FarmersMarketPros.com. Well, welcome back to Tent Talk, everyone. Our guest this week is Sadie Sheffer, CEO and founder of Bread Seriously. Sadie started making gluten-free sourdough in her home in San Francisco back in 2011. After sharing her new recipe with a few friends, she was soon riding her bike all around the city, delivering fresh baked loaves and selling them at local farmers markets throughout the Bay Area. Over 10 years later, Sadie's bread can be found on grocery store shelves and purchased online. Welcome to Tent Talk, Sadie. It's a pleasure to be here with (laughs) y'all. We're so excited to talk to you today. Um, We're just going to start with a couple questions about your backgrounds. Can you tell us a little bit about your professional background and what you were doing before you were making gluten-free bread? Yeah, there's not much to tell. I don't have much of a professional background. I launched Bread Seriously when I was 22. Wow. Oh, wow. wow. So, <laughs> so I'm a proud college dropout. Um, my first job after college was building parade floats for the San Francisco Chinese New Year Parade, Year of the Tiger. Um, I got to put glitter on the tigers. It was a, it was a very interesting first job. That sounds then like a dream a job, just like <laughs> glittering it, it tigers. It sounds like a dream job. It was kind of a nightmare job oh. <laughs> with good stories. <laughs> very unsafe. <laughs> Whoa. And, and yeah. hard to fit into a resume, probably. Expert you glitter know, sprinkler. Yeah, my resume is like, it's a head scratcher. <laughs> so then I was a barista. Um, and while I was a barista, I... Uh, was also working at farmers markets for Serendipity Farms in San Francisco. And while I was doing that, I launched Bread Seriously. So <laughs> sort of a, a random smattering. So you were working other places and decided to launch your own um, bread company. So how did you, were you like making bread on the side and thought you should start doing it professionally because people were telling you how great it was? That's how we Hear, we hear that story a lot from vendors. <laughs> yeah, not exactly. Um, right. So I've always run hobby businesses. My, so like my whole family is self-employed. Um, and so I always assumed that I would be self-employed, not because I thought that was cool, just like that was the only option in my mind. Like I didn't even realize that there were other options of working for people. It was kind of funny. I got to college and people were going to the career fair and I was like, What's that? Say what now? <laughs> you can apply to work for someone else. Somebody pays me? And st- yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought you just, you work your butt off. And at the end of the year, if there's anything left over, you pay yourself. That's how I thought it all worked, right? That's um, how I was raised. <laughs> so I had, I had three hobby businesses before Bread Seriously, like selling t-shirts. I, I would screen print t-shirts and sell them like from my locker in high school or at craft shows in college, things like that. Um, and then when I moved out to San Francisco, I started making like bicycle accessories and selling that. And so bread seriously was just the fourth hobby business. Um, cause I had been, I started baking gluten-free stuff when I moved to San Francisco, I dropped out of college, followed my college crush to San Francisco, things didn't work out, but he was gluten intolerant. And so I 
tried to strategize how to make them work out um, via, you know, brute force and delicious gluten-free things. You will um, love me. <laughs> you will love me. <laughs> exactly. Like I, I, t- I had this, like a many, many frontal approach. Of, like, <laughs> you know, maybe it's the food. Maybe he'll like my bicycle accessories, that kind of thing. <laughs> Hey, you gotta um, try anything, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I got really into the gluten-free baking. It was a real challenge for me. And I am someone who likes being good at things. So <laughs> I took it very personally when I was not good at gluten-free baking at the start. And so I was just determined to like figure out how to nail it. Um, and eventually I did, but that was cool. Um, <laughs> so there was like 10 months of that. Finally, Jesse took an interest to me. We started dating and that was cool. Um, and so it then worked. it did work. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, maybe a year, no, like six months later, I got really interested in fermentation. I was like fermenting pickles. Cause you know, I got paid in produce at the farmer's market. Um, and I mean, I also got paid in money, but the produce was my favorite part. Um, <laughs> well worked for food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, and then I I was reading about fermentation and started reading about sourdough um, and thought like, oh, bummer. Like, I bet I can't make that gluten-free, but I'll just try it anyway. And that was uh, the start of Bread Seriously. So did like six months of experimentation was like, I got this, let's launch a bread company. Just emailed all my friends. Um, I didn't even tell Jesse. I just like decided spur of the moment and emailed everybody and he came home from work. Like, I hear you're starting a company. That's cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it was very impulsive. And then, um, it was only like nine months from launch to going full time with Bread Seriously. Wow. I want to, I want to know what you have against bells. So <laughs> Sadie's <laughs> business name is Bread, S-R-S-L-Y, which we translate as seriously, but, but why that? Why'd you go that way? I wanted something that sounded edgy, and that's the first thing that popped there into you go. my mind. <laughs> All right. We've come right. up with some backstory for it, like it's seriously good for you, or it's seriously delicious. We take bread seriously. All of these things, but really, it was just like a random idea. <laughs> it's cute. I like it. It is cute. It's kind of like like management, like MGMT. Yeah, yeah. like mm-hmm. yeah, stands out. <laughs> totally cute. So at first, you were delivering your bread to your friends that like signed up to purchase from you. Is that how it was working? And you were delivering via bicycle around town? At first, people were just picking up from my apartment. Um, but, you know, it was like five people would come by. And I lived in Coal Valley, which is sort of snack in the middle of San Francisco. And it's kind of inconvenient to get to. It's like the public transit isn't super amazing there. Um, and so I've figured like if I could deliver stuff more people would order and so I talked to my friend who worked at the farmer's market and said like do you want to be my delivery person because you had a car I didn't know how to drive at this point I'm a New Yorker I didn't learn how to drive till I was 24 or 25 Um, (laughs) so uh, he said yes totally I'll deliver bread for you and so the next week rolled around I baked the bread he didn't show up And I called him and he was like, I'm literally in the ocean surfing right now. Like I totally forgot. And I had to deliver these breads in like the next 30 minutes. So I got on my bike and delivered them. And then that was like, okay, now we're a bike delivery company. (laughs) Um, Meshing a lot of interests. I mean, it sounds good. (laughs) I got tons of exercise. Like at one point I was biking like a hundred miles a week without leaving San Francisco, which is kind of like, it's pretty small. Um, So that was a little nutty. Very hilly. Yeah. Those well, it offsets like, all the bread you were that's probably right. eating. So yeah. and know. At least it bread is wild. kind of light, I guess, to carry. It could be heavier. No. Things. No. It's pretty dense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so but, heavy. But luckily, like, the, uh, we got, like, a ton of press because, like, I think people were like, oh, gluten-free bread, that's cool. Bike delivery, that's cool, right? So, like, that really just got our name out, um, and it just catapulted us into full-time Hey, having a cool story. That's what it's all about. (laughs) For sure. Yeah. So at what point did you stop doing that and make the transition? Oh, it was like a couple years later, I think. Oh, wow. Okay. So you did Um, it for a while. We did it for a while. Yeah. Then then what what made you decide to try farmer's markets instead? Just tired of all that peddling? (laughs) Actually, farmer's market, like the original business plan was to just do farmer's markets because I loved being at farmer's. That was my social scene. Um, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir a bit here. Like loved it, you know, loved being able to just bring home like flats of fruit and 
make all these weird things. And, um, you know, that's where all my friends were. It was great. So I was like, cool. I know what I want to do. I'm going to have my own farmer's market booth. And my plan was to do like nine farmer's markets a week, all via cargo bike. And I was going to design a custom cargo bike that could fit my tent and all this stuff, you know. Um, and then I got into my first farmer's market, which was the Mission Community Market in San Francisco. And it was terrible. Like the market was nice, but we lost money every week. <laughs> I was so tired because I was like baking. I didn't have my cargo bike yet. So I hired someone to pick me up and drive me to the market <laughs> and pick me up and drive me home because I couldn't carry the tent. You know, it was just like, you know, it cost us about $200 to do the market, hire the help and the ingredients for all the products. And we would make about $150 at the market. You know, it was just like, well, this isn't working how I thought it would. Um, and at the same time, I had just started selling bread to buy right market, which was just up the street from that farmer's market. And they were selling the same amount of bread without me having to be there. I was like, well, I see the way this is going. Let's become a wholesale business. Um, so I scrapped that business plan. We finally went back to farmer's markets in summer 2019 and oh. stuck it out until COVID started. So it took you a while just, to go back. Took us a while to go back. And we just did, again, one market um, at Temescal in Oakland, which was lovely. And we did make some money there, which is nice. Um, but once COVID started, we pulled out and um, on, on assessing like whether it was worth it, we're sort of at like, eh, maybe it's not really helping us reach our goals. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. some people approach it as it's a marketing thing. If you've got other outlets, you know, you're meeting people, you're talking to them, you're getting that focus group thing, but you still need to make sure that it makes money for you, obviously. Um, so sounds like sort of a brief period really in farmer's markets then, right? Much briefer than I expected. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that COVID thing. <laughs> so, so what's it like selling sourdough in an area of America that's like famous for sourdough? <laughs> well. It's it's funny, like there's so much mystique around San Francisco sourdough and like nobody knows why. And so there's some really interesting like storytelling around it, which I love. Um, so for those of you listening who don't know much about sourdough, it's a wild fermented product. So a sourdough culture is a culture of wild yeast, bacteria and fungi that work together to leaven bread dough. So they break down the grains, they break down the proteins and the sugars, they create lactic acid and carbon dioxide. Um, it's awesome. Like all bread used to be sourdough, but for some reason, San Francisco sourdough is like the thing people have heard about. Uh, it's definitely not the first or the original like every culture has their version of sourdough. Um, but yeah, there's like a special lactobacillus called lactobacillus san franciscensis. There's all sorts of theories. Maybe it's the fog, maybe it's other stuff. And it does definitely have like sourdough. It's got like, I don't know, terroir. Like it has a different characteristic in different places. Um, there's a cool thing called the sourdough project out of, I think out of Tufts maybe, um, that analyze 500 sourdough starters from around the world for like what different living organisms are in them. And there's a whole database you can look at. Uh, super fascinating. And each one will have like distinctive flavors. So even moving from San Francisco to Berkeley, which we did in 2017, we were worried that our, our flavor would change. It hasn't changed perceptively. Um, but we did do an experiment a couple of years ago where we sent some sourdough starter to a friend in Denver, to my brother-in-law actually, um, and had him keep it alive for a year and bake bread throughout that time. And after a year, we, he, he shipped us some bread and it definitely has like a very distinctive change. Oh, interesting. Uh, oh, wow. So just yeah. the, what it's picking up from the air and things is just changing it. Right. Yep. And, and the yep. water and yeah. Oh, and very, things. very interesting. Have you yeah. read, have you read sourdough? The book? Yeah. The, the novel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. It's yeah. Great. It's great. So that's, you know, it's uh, digs deep into sourdough and the life of a sourdough starter. And it's mm -hmm. also about, somebody in the Bay Area who's getting into farmer's markets with their sourdough bread. And then it's got a whole different storyline. It's a, a San Francisco-based writer, but I love that book. Um, and, you know, was it modeled on you? You're a sourdough baker that <laughs> got into farmer's I've markets. I've never met that author, so uh, I know it was right. modeled on me, but it's an adorable book about this sentient sourdough. Um, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. I would just was just reading, actually,
actually an interview with a baker in London that says that it's just outrageous that anybody eats any bread that's not sourdough, that we've ever gotten into commercial yeasts and that it's just ridiculous. I agree, but most people don't know that. If anyone's looking to like really do a deep dive, there's this amazing book called White Bread that is a social history of bread in America. It's fascinating to read about like the historical context in which we switched from sourdough to yeasted bread and to mass produced bread and then to enriched bread. Um, it's mind blowing. Yeah. Interesting. And, you know, farmer Mai Yen, who's spoken at our conference and things too, is a great resource on that yeah. really talks about heirloom grains and sourdough and, you know, what makes bread good for you and what makes bread not so good for you. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's interesting. they're amazing. I love their work. So if you, um, it sounds to me like you're probably not going back to farmer's markets. What advice would you give to a brand that's analyzing whether farmer's markets are a good part of their long-term plan? I'm all about these days, like defining winning or defining success. And I'm a big proponent of the idea that everybody's definition should be different. Um, and it's taken us a long time to come to terms with like the fact that Red Series' definition of success is not to become a billion dollar company. It's not to dominate the bread market. Like we're pretty happy in our little corner. Um, we're really happy with our very small group of products. Um, a big part of our success statement is our impact. Actually, all of our success statement is about our contribution to our community. Um, but community, we're defining a little more as our customers um, and the community of small businesses that we're in and our community of employees. So farmer's market could squeeze into that definition, but it doesn't have to. There's other ways to find success with that. Um, If your definition of success is to become a billion dollar brand, is a farmer's market going to get you there? Or if your definition of success is to have work-life balance, is a farmer's market going to get you there? Sometimes the answer is going to be yes. Sometimes the answer is going to be maybe. You might need to like do a little more exploration there. Um, I personally find that like when I physically don't have energy, I can't really make good decisions. And so farmers markets, you know, can be exhausting. Like they were so much fun when I was 20 and I loved them. And now that I'm not in my twenties, like they're, you know, they take a big toll on me. So maybe that's not like my long-term plan anymore. Um, I think it's going to be really different for every business. And especially depending if you, the business owner, are the, also the one staff in your booth, or if you have staff to do it, if you do have staff to do it, and your goal is to have those community relationships, are they, are, do, do those people like have the skill set to make, you know, small talk with your customers? Are they empowered to, to have those important conversations? Do you have systems to get that feedback from them? Like, I, I really think like, um, about the concept of ROI, return on investment, like it doesn't have to be monetary, like what what am I getting from this dollar? But like every, like all of the effort that we're putting into the business is, are we getting a return on that? Is it worth our energy? Is it worth our bandwidth? And if, even if it is, are there things we could be doing with that effort that are even more effective Great. Sounds like you've really dug down and thought about it and weighed the options. And we always suggest that everybody do that, that they look at how's it going to affect their lifestyle. Some For some people, farmer's markets are ideal in terms of work-life balance because they can do just that one day a week and maybe a couple of days production and still have time for other interests or for family or young children or that kind of thing. For other people, not so much. You know, it's not the best use of their energy and their uh, – Tent weightlifting skills. <laughs> yeah, I feel yeah. like I've had this conversation a lot with with vendors that are either saying like they want to exit the market, and so I I love to have like you know exit interviews with them and just say like how is you know why did you come to this decision or people that are saying like I'm not sure like how do I make this work better for me and I think some people just find the market to be like speaking in terms of like is it a battery charger for you or is it a battery drainer yeah. and just depending on like your like personality and how you're like what invigorates you and what energizes you it's different for everybody so sometimes getting to the market and being social and being in a little cell and being around people and being outside that's a super battery charger and those people love the market and they stay in the market for years and years and years and some people it, like you're saying it just is a battery drain on you yeah. because it is physically exhausting and if it doesn't feel like you know you're getting enough out of it while you're there that can add to the drain so it's just analyzing like sure. what kind of like looking at your life before you come into the market like what has invigorated you is it being outdoors is it like using your energy in that kind of way or is your are you invigorated by like 
coming up with other ideas and using your skills to maybe, you know, bring your bread to stores that you really like and mm-hmm. connecting with your community that way. So I always like talking to people who leave the market or decide not to come to the market because it's good to get that side of it as well. We're always kind of encouraging people to come and to stay, of course, vendors in our markets. But um, I like to hear the other side of it, too, just so I can have a better understanding of that. Yeah. And it's funny, too, that, city you had this, like, because you'd worked in farmer's markets, you really loved it. That was your scene. You had this, like, drive to be there. And then you realize, like, this actually doesn't really work for me in my business. And that is, like, so much of, like, entrepreneurship of, like, you have this idea of what everything's going to be like. And, like, oh, I'm going to, like. Do nine markets. Yeah, yeah I'm going to do all these amazing things. And then when you're actually in it, you have to then analyze, like, is this actually working for me? And mm-hmm. sometimes it ends up being, like, the opposite of what you expected. Well, mm-hmm. it's probably a different experience being there as an owner as well. Like yeah. I know for you, Justine, <clears throat> Justine and her husband had a hot sauce business and were in the markets and Dave would just take it in stride. But I think Justine had real abandonment issues and rejection <laughs> issues when people would take a sample and not react yeah. excitedly. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was totally different. And I was so surprised. Like I loved selling at selling kale at the farmer's market for, you know, my friend Jamie at Serendipity Farms. Loved it. Like could talk about vegetables all day. Didn't take any offense when people decided they didn't like vegetables, you know, <laughs> like um, it was fantastic. I would, you know, walk around trading and like uh, was like super extroverted. I, it turns out I'm a shy extrovert and I like get really shy when I'm talking about my own products. I had like definite rejection issues when people came back to the booth and was like, I didn't like this or things like that. Like I don't, I've grown out of some of it, but like I didn't have that joy and like unfettered fun that I had when I was working for someone else. And I also didn't have the financial stress when I was working for someone else, but I'm analyzing every moment. Like we're not making the sales we thought we were going to make. We're going to have to donate all this product because we can't, we don't have any other markets and there's nowhere else to sell it, you know? Um, And that really just like took the wind out of my sales. Yeah. Yeah. I was the same way, but for Dave, he, his battery is charged by, talking to hundreds of people every yeah. single day. Yeah. And yeah. they would show up tired and be a ball of energy at the yeah. end of the market. And I'm like, why is that happening to yeah. you? He, but he, he just feeds on that, yeah. that social interaction. And, yeah. and then some of us don't. I'm, I'm the same way, Sadie. I'm an introvert masquerading as an extrovert in, in many of my work situations. But yeah. truly, you know, being in a corner with a book is fine with me. So so it, it uses you up when you're doing that social stuff. Even yeah. It's fun. I enjoy, you know, talking to people or speaking at events and that kind of Kind of thing, but at the same time, that's not that doesn't put energy in for me. Yeah. That's something mm-hmm. that you know pulls. And out. that's hard to know if you're a first time business owner. You might not know what type of person you sure. are, uh-huh. which is good. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, even if you don't stay in markets, that's what's so wonderful about using the farmers markets as a way to launch your business is because generally the the barrier of entry is pretty low. And if you try markets for a couple months and it doesn't work out for you. That's okay. That's it's okay. not like you opened a restaurant and realized you hate being a restaurant. And you have tour. a three year lease or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sure. So you can pivot. And it's okay to back away slowly yeah. and then visit as a shopper still and just keep kinda, baking your bread. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's great. Absolutely. Yeah. Farmers markets are such a good testing ground. Test new products, test new messaging, test new ingredients, test new signage. Like, just like, I love prototyping and experimenting and farmers markets are such a perfect place for that. Like so many food businesses get their start there. Um, Even like giant brands that everybody's heard of now. Um, And that's, it's such a valuable resource. Um, Having worked for a farmer at the farmers markets, I feel like I have a slightly different perspective of like the value of them and really supporting local agriculture. Um, And so I feel like the, the packaged food at farmers markets it's like nice to be able to have that testing ground but like the real value of farmers markets in the community is to support the farmer is like totally absolutely that. keep yeah. farmers farming yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um another really unique aspect of your business is that you started selling gluten-free products kind of i don't know maybe you have a different perspective but kind of before the huge boom of now there's gluten-free options everywhere, and it kind of used to just be like, all right, well, you have to eat spelt bread or whatever. <laughs> you know, there weren't many options when you first started um, baking gluten-free. So, like, how has your business changed over the years now that gluten-free is kind of less of a trend and more of a, like, legitimized, like, lifestyle choice or kind of, like, dietary point of view, if you will? Yeah, 
Um, that's a great question. I, I think that if it hadn't, if it had already been a big thing, I probably would never have started. Um, and I've, I've like done a lot of soul searching in the last years, like trying to kind of understand why I did, why I have done what I've done in my life. Um, and like my life at the time I started Red Seriously, I had just dropped out of college where I was like not doing well, not thriving, not doing well in classes. Um, and I was so done with like following other people's rules or like, you know, following and failing at other people's rules that I just needed a place to play and to break all the rules or make up all my own rules. And gluten-free baking was that because in 2010, when I started, or 2009, when I started baking just for Jesse before bed, seriously, there were like a few blogs <laughs> about how to do it. There were a few cookbooks, there were a few products on the shelf. Um, and so I, I read some of those and was like, these people didn't know anything before they wrote these blogs. Like, I don't know anything, but I don't have to follow the rules that are already there because there's only like two of them and maybe they're not true. Like, whereas with, with gluten, like there's tons of rules, right? Like there's like, these are the recipes. Don't over mix. Baking is a, is a science, you know? And I was just like, nah, <laughs> I just want to have fun. Like I didn't even own measuring cups for like the first year of, gluten-free baking I just like literally did handfuls of stuff and I just had fun with it and like I needed that to sort of rebuild my confidence after school um so like coming up with the rules myself coming up with a recipe like professional chefs and bakers will look at our recipes and they'll say these don't work these recipes don't work. They don't have protein in them. They don't have fat in them. I'm just like, well, they work. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Here's a loaf of bread. (laughs) (laughs) It's really funny. So I just needed that place to like become an expert without having too many of like other people's expectations on it. Um, so I think that's the biggest way I can answer that question. And, and since then, yeah, it's definitely changed. We've got a lot more competitors on the shelf. Um, you know, which is both good and bad. You know, it's harder to sell bread. Our sales are not as fast as they were in the past or we're not growing as fast as we were. But early on, I set out the goal. Like our our mission has sort of, has evolved throughout the 10 years of Bread Seriously. But in the beginning, I was really inspired by the history of sourdough and wanting to have sourdough be more mainstream. And so I would say like, if I'm doing my job right, we'll go out of business because there will be so many other gluten-free sourdoughs on the shelf. And now there are, and that's like, I have to remember that, you know, 10 years ago, I was saying that that was my goal (laughs) is to see other people making this. Um, So I, you know, I'm really proud that I started when I did. I'm really proud that maybe some other brands have taken inspiration from us um, and figured out their own way to make sourdough and like get that you know, process yeast out of the gluten-free bread world. Like our guts are sensitive. So <laughs> let's all eat sourdough. Yeah. Love yeah, it. for sure. And uh, Sadie, I think originally I found you or you found us through Ali Ball and I took Ali Ball's retail ready and you had worked with her and she had used, I think some of your branding in some of her curriculum. This was a couple of years ago, so I'm not remembering exactly, but I know you've done so much work of, you know, honing your brand messaging and, and just really figuring out what you want to say to your customers and answering those questions. And if you check out Bread Seriously website, it's just like very cute and very fun. And I feel like it really represents who Sadie is and what, what you're doing. Um, But because you sell allergen free products, I feel like people that are looking for your brand probably have a lot of questions um, so like, what are your most common questions from customers and how do you address those in your messaging? Um, I was, I saw this question in your email before I was, I was trying to think about it. Cause I, customer care is, um, we have someone else on the team who does that. Um, we put a lot of emphasis on customer care as like part of our brand and part of the brand experience. Um, so our team is always talking to customers and getting questions, but I'm not really part of that. So I made some assumptions and I think 
that actually the most common questions we get are about logistics. Like I placed my order. When will I get my bed? <laughs> like, I want it now. Yeah. yeah um, in terms of the, like the products themselves, we, it's a quirky product. Um, so it's a really high hydration bread, which means that the final product is like really moist. Um, so like the texture is different than you would expect if you have just been eating regular bread your whole life. Um, if we're the first gluten-free bread you're ever trying, you might be a little like, hmm, this is really different. But if you've tried all the other brands and then you come to us, you're like, oh my God, thank goodness there's a real bread. So there's like a real, there's kind of a learning curve to, <laughs> to gluten-free bread. Um, gluten-free bread tends to be like super dry and crumbly and ours is like super moist and elastic. Um, I'm ordering some of that bread as soon as we get off. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. um, The flavor is quite different. If you haven't had a sourdough before, I was talking to, um, I'm taking Spanish classes and I was talking to my Spanish teacher the other day and she was telling me this story about how when she first moved to the U.S., she didn't really speak English. She ordered some bread at a cafe and it was sourdough bread and she ate it and she took it back and said, this bread is not good. <laughs> it has gone sour. It's you know? gone bad. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like not everyone has had it and, and it's an acquired taste. Um, so I would say apart from that, um, we do get a lot of questions about wild yeast, um, especially from people who have either a yeast allergy or sensitivity or a mold allergy and sensitivity. Um, and so there is a big difference between wild yeast and processed yeast. Um, so like a baker's yeast or a brewer's yeast. Processed yeast is basically a single strain of yeast, whereas wild yeast is many, an unknown number of strains. Um, and the wild yeast also come with wild bacteria and wild fungi, and they all work like symbiotically to break down the grains. But baker's yeast um it's basically like the best analogy is a monoculture like it just doesn't do all of the wonderful things that a um a polyculture would do um so it doesn't break down the grains as thoroughly it only breaks down the sugars but not the proteins um because baker's yeast is so fast acting it really doesn't have time to break down the sugars anyway Uh, most bread that has baker's yeast also has sugar added so it's just breaking down the added sugar it's not even touching the sugars that are in the grains Um, so there's just so many health benefits to a sour to a true sourdough like watch out because some sourdoughs just have sourdough flavoring in them and don't actually have a wild sourdough culture so check your ingredients know your baker ask them all the hard questions grain washing Um, (laughs) <laughs> brainwashing, brainwashing. You're so brainwashed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so a lot of people who can't have single strain yeasts can have sourdough. Some people can't. Um, so, you know, you want to like make these decisions smartly for yourself, for your own body, with your doctor or whatever your style is. Um, a lot of people with mold allergies still stay steer clear of sourdough because it's a fermented product. So if you avoid foods like kraut or yogurt, you probably want to avoid sourdough as well. Um, But if you can eat those foods and other things that are fermented with, you know, probiotics, um, sourdough could be a good bet. Cool. So are there any specific like regulations or legal requirements to you have to follow or maintain for the title of like gluten free or allergy free? Um, Yeah. So for gluten free, the FDA finally added some rules a couple years ago. I don't remember how long ago, maybe five years ago. Um, There were really no rules before and um, uh, different like celiac organizations had been really fighting to get some rules. Um, The first pass was sort of just like lip service. Like the rules was that you had to have your products test below 20 parts per million for gluten. But they didn't actually require any testing. You only had to get it tested if you like were sued over it. Um, So it was like the honor system. (laughs) Um, So most brands will get certified through an agency. The most popular agency is the gluten-free certification organization or GFCO. And that you'll see like a little GF in a circle. That's their logo. And they're just updating it to, they have a new logo now. So it's a little harder to describe in words. Uh, (laughs) So that's the most common one. Their standards are less than 10 parts per million. So twice as strict as the FDA. There's another smaller organization that has rebranded a bunch of times and I don't remember what it's called anymore. It used to be called the Celiac Screw Association. Um, And their standard is five, less than five parts per million, but their 
methods of testing are less strict, like less than five parts per million, but you only have to test once a year. Whereas GFCO is less than 10 parts per million, but you test weekly. So there's, there's a lot of standards out there, but brands are opting into them. Like you don't have to be certified gluten-free to be labeled gluten-free if you follow the FDA standards, but consumers, you know, are savvy and um, especially people with celiac disease, like definitely follow those official logos. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so what, since you've been operating in this space for a long time, and it kind of seems like prior to a couple of years ago, it was kind of the wild west out there in terms of saying that things are gluten-free or allergen-free. Um, so since you've been in this industry for a decade now, what advice would you give to other businesses, whether they're selling at the farmer's market or they're selling online, that specialize in some sort of like health conscious product for people that are either for, you know, they have specific like needs or they're trying to kind of shift their lifestyle? Um, anything that you've learned along the way in the gluten free space? Yeah. I don't know if my answer is going to be gluten-free specific. You mentioned Ali Ball, um, which is where I've heard about the intense conference and then met you all a couple of years ago. Um, and she, I love her. If you all haven't heard of her, look her up and take her course retail ready. You'll learn so much. She's a genius. Um, but the way she teaches, um, like young brands to interact with their customers or to think about their customers is to really understand them. Um, not like you know, go out and talk to people and have empathy with them so much, like not, not like that. Yes, that, but that's not the core of what she's saying. Like figure out who your target customer is um, and understand what they're looking for in your brand and what you can offer them. So like, for example, if you make, um, it, gosh, it's hard to think of an example on the spot. Um, it comes down to, for me, like, why you're selling your products to your customers and why your product, why your customers are buying those products. And you want to refine your messaging to really answer that one question. Um, and if you have three answers, like it tastes great, it'll make you feel great. And it uses this really cool heirloom grain that no one else uses. Maybe pick one of those. <laughs> like that's a lot to try to pitch. And that'll be some confusing messaging. Like, maybe your product just needs to taste great to connect with your target customer. Or maybe the taste doesn't matter and your target customer just wants to support heirloom grain farmers and, you know, pitch that angle. Um, so like we could say a lot of things about our product. We could say, hey, it's gluten-free, it's vegan, it's kosher. It doesn't have nuts in it. Um, but if we just stick to one of those, it's probably going to be stronger messaging. It can still have all those things and that's cool and we'll cast a wider net. But if we're trying to sell to everyone at once and pick, pitch every angle at once, we're not really going to get anywhere, if that makes sense. It yeah. makes so much sense. I think that's something people really need to remember. You, If you're aiming at everyone, you're going to miss most folks. So yeah. you know, if you narrow down and know who your ideal customer is and really pitch to them, then you'll also pick up some additional people on the side, mm -hmm. but you're really getting to the folks that are looking for you. Yeah. 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 You sort of want to make it bite-sized to fall in love with your brand. And then once someone has fallen in love with it, they'll go and read your website and also learn, oh, wow, it's also top nine allergen free. It's also certified kosher. Let me tell my friend who keeps kosher, you know, that kind of thing. But they don't need to know it all up front. Like let them, let them do like a little a slow burn of getting to know your brand. Um, they'll learn all the cool things and that builds even more loyalty. That builds more word of mouth. Have you heard about this cool brand? They make gluten-free sourdough. They're also blah, 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 blah you know, um, it doesn't have to like all be upfront. It doesn't have to all be featured on your packaging because your packaging will, you know, look like Dr. Bronner's and like <laughs> a million words on it. Like oh, a yeah. manifesto. Dr. Bronner's. <laughs> like manifesto for bread. Yeah. And, yeah, and I yeah. think centering on the idea that it tastes good is, is probably never a bad approach. Yeah. Yeah. Start You're with gonna that. Like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, interestingly, it's sometimes a bad approach when you're doing wholesale. Ah, um, there you go. Because sure. Because you want to focus on how your product sells off the shelf. Absolutely. The taste doesn't really matter to a grocery buyer, for example. But at the farmer's market, that's a totally different yeah. story <laughs> when you have the opportunity to get something in someone's mouth, which again, is like, I don't even know how that's happening since COVID. Like that's been such a, a weird one to navigate. You know, we used to go to the farmer's market. We would bring samples and hand them out, right? Like, Ugh. actually, <laughs> I don't we want could... to eat anything out in public. No, actually we can do that again. Cause back then at the, 
beginning stages, we thought that it was transmitted, you know, hand to hand. And that, yeah, that was yeah. the approach. Don't let anybody touch anything. Yeah. Uh, make sure you have gloves or wash your hands between each transaction. Put a table in front of your booth so they can't get too close. Now yep. that we know that it's airborne, um, it's kind of a different approach. We still really discourage the do-it-yourself sampling. You don't put out – and for a whole bunch of reasons, that's never a good idea. Anyway, that was always gross. That was always a bad <laughs> yeah. idea. Pandemic it wasn't, or not. It wasn't sanitary, <laughs> and it also just you attracted a lot of buffet kind of folks that yeah. were there for the samples for breakfast as opposed to buying. But you can still for sample sure. now by individually handing something to somebody with a toothpick or in a solo cup or you know some way so you're not – actually touching their food, but getting it in their mouths is still a really effective way to sell, no yeah. doubt about it. And now that there's not masks mandated at right. the market, too, because that was another thing that if you have well, a mask yeah, that on, was the you other can't thing. put a sample in your mouth. You couldn't <laughs> sample because you'd have to I take your mask off yeah. Yeah, to do it. So, <laughs> Ah, <we're>, COVID. <laughs> hopefully we're just way beyond that and we'll stay beyond that. Let's so. hope. Yes. Yeah. Knock whatever wood is closest to you. <laughs> Sadie, it's really been a pleasure talking to you. I love how analytical you are about your business and how you've dug in and also uh, not just your business, but your life. And, you know, keeping that in mind that finding the right size business for you is absolutely the most important for everybody. Thank you. It's been so fun to talk with you all. You ask great questions and it's lovely to see you. I haven't seen you in yeah, many years now. too long. It's nice yeah. to come back to Chance, even if you're not in Farmer's Markets. Just come see us. Just come hang out. <laughs> Have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> great talking to you, Sadie. Thank you. Thanks, Sadie. Thanks for listening today. And big thanks to Sarah Delavan Consulting for helping small food makers reduce stress, achieve financial sustainability, and grow their businesses. And for supporting Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast. Listen to Sarah on the Good Food CFO Podcast and connect with her by clicking the Sarah Delavan Consulting logo on the resource page at FarmersMarketPros.com. Farmer's Markets are all about connection. And all of us, operators, farmers, and vendors, keep learning. Connect with people just like you from various parts of the country and share what's happening in your area in the terrific conversations over in our private Facebook group, the Farmer's Market Pros Community. If you're actively involved in a farmer's market, please find us there, answer the three qualifying questions, and join the group. You can also message us on Instagram at Farmer's Market Pros or email us at connect at farmersmarketpros.com. If you're looking for further education, check out our online course offerings at FarmersMarketPros.com. Thanks for listening to Tent Talk. Please leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you access your podcasts and tell us and others how you're enjoying Tent Talk. And be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss the next episode. Tent Talk, the Farmers Market Podcast, is proudly produced by Farmers Market Pros, where passion meets profit. Today's episode was recorded and edited by Justine Marzoni Mead. Original music by David Mead. Thank you so much for listening today, and we'll have another great episode next week, so tune in.